with the Church of Scientology, when you're in court, it becomes a protracted act of warfare. It is about destroying you and who you are. If you're a mother just seeking answers and the truth for her dead child, it doesn't matter. They want to destroy you. And I cannot put enough emphasis on that. It does not matter. This is an organization, and I will call it a church, but they will ask you to check your soul at the door. They do not care. And my son was nothing more. I have more emotion and compassion for roadkill that, than was ever shown toward my child. It's 18 minutes after the hour of 5 o'clock. I'm Coy Barefoot. You're listening to Inside Charlottesville on 107.5 FM WCHV. Today on the program, we will devote the entire time to one topic, and that is the still unexplained tragic death of 20-year-old Charlottesville resident Kyle Brennan. Kyle was found dead of a gunshot wound to the head in the home of his Scientologist father in Clearwater, Florida in February of 2007. Kyle was declared dead of an apparent suicide, the police said, yet his own fingerprints were not found on the gun, nor was gunshot residue found on his hands. Why did Kyle's father call Scientologists to the scene that night for their advice before anyone even called 911? Why was the bullet that killed Kyle never found? Why did police investigators lie repeatedly to members of Kyle's family? Why did witnesses who were there that night appear to change their stories every time they were deposed? There are countless other questions and mysteries about Kyle's passing, yet there are few answers. Is something, the truth, being covered up about what happened to Kyle? What does his tragic death have to do with the cult of secrecy that is Scientology, if anything? And what about the allegations of police misconduct in Clearwater, Florida? which is the home of the headquarters of the Church of Scientology. I am very privileged to welcome to this program today Kyle's mother, Victoria Britton, and Kyle's stepfather, Rick Britton, who has been a guest on this program many times. I'm so glad you both are here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, Coy. We appreciate it. Um, I want to start just by uh, saying a couple of things, reminding the listeners, that we're going to deal with some um, some pretty graphic stuff today on this program, and this may not be appropriate for, for younger listeners. I also want to express to you both, um, especially you, Victoria, my, my sincere empathy um, over, the, over the loss of, of your son. Um, I remember going to the service, um, years ago, back in 2007, and um, I just want to say how truly sorry I am that um, that you you continue to endure this nightmare that is that is losing a child, and losing a child in such unexplained, mysterious circumstances, tragic circumstances. And I'm speaking for everyone who is listening now, broadcast and podcast. How truly sorry we are, um, you as a as a as our neighbor, as a member of this community. We're so sorry what happened. Um, Rick, will you get us started with just a preface that I know that you have prepared that will sort sure. of frame this conversation so that so we know what we're talking about? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, my stepson Kyle Brennan. He was only twenty years old at the time. He died eight years ago the evening of February 16, 2007. 
under extremely suspicious circumstances in the Clearwater, Florida apartment of his Scientologist father, Tom Brennan. And as you mentioned, right nearby in Clearwater, downtown Clearwater, is the Fort Harrison Hotel, which happens to be the worldwide headquarters of the Church of Scientology. This path that my wife Victoria and I are on started eight years ago with Victoria asking questions of the Clearwater police. Eight years later, many of those basic questions are still unanswered. Thanks to all the lying done by the police, the medical examiner's office, and the Scientologists involved, we still don't know how Kyle died or whether he was murdered. Of one thing, we're certain. Presented with the facts of the case and proof of the numerous lies that were told, any reasonable person would conclude, as we have, that something other than what was reported by the police took place in Tom Brennan's apartment the evening Kyle died. Uh, People who are innocent don't need to lie the numerous, numerous times. And that really is the takeaway from this conversation today. None of us are speaking for anyone else but ourselves. We're only speaking about our own personal experiences here. And we don't know if, if, if any member of Scientology was involved in a crime. We don't know. That, that is the absolute takeaway that there are just a number of unanswered questions and mysteries. I would say a myriad. I mean, it's, it's a huge number so that when you start going through it and we've told the story to friends and, of course, family number a number of times when you go through it and you start talking about all the lies and all the things that were unanswered, the average person just goes, oh, my God. Yeah. And oh, so my God. Let's do that today. Let us share this story with people so they know, um, so they know what, what you know. And, Victoria, take us back to the night that you got a, a phone call. Take us back to the moment when this story started. Kyle was traveling, right? And he was down in Clearwater visiting visiting his dad. That is true. He was um he had traveled. He had been to Hawaii and he was camping out on the beach for about a week there and then um decided to head back to to um to stateside and went to Clearwater, Florida to kind of rest up before he was planning on heading back home to Virginia. And, and as I, I begin to tell the story, I, I want to, um, before I start, uh, I'm going to go back to the, the very, the worst day of my life and to the, the worst moment of my life. So if I break up a little bit as I start to um, talk, you know, you know, please forgive me. I'll, of course. I'll, I'll do my best of to course. hold it together because it. it Of course, what I'm going to tell you is every parent's biggest fear and worst nightmare, and that is to get a phone call in the middle of the night. And this is what happened to um, to Rick and I on the on the er, in the early morning hours of February 17th, 2007. Um, You know that phone rang, and and it was in because when I picked up the phone, I, I. looked at it and I could see it was a phone call coming from Florida and I just had this overwhelming sense of dread even before I answered it and I answered that phone and and said hello and a, and a a strange voice came on the other end someone I I I did not know who it was he did not identify himself he was very um, robotic. That's the only word that I can think of to describe how he he sounded and came across. And he asked me, he was, um, you know, very point blank, is this Victoria? And I said, yes, it is. And he's there, you know, I'm calling you from Florida and your son is dead. Your son is dead. He died tonight. And that was it. And I, I didn't know in that moment, you know, is this a prank call? Is this some kind of a, a sick joke that, that someone is playing on me? And I started to scream. 
And and Rick, of course, res- responded and said, you know, what is wrong? And I said, there's a strange man on the phone, and he's telling me that Kyle is dead. And and, and Rick grabbed the phone, and I, at, and at that time, when you are, um, I started going into shock. And, and, it, and it's an interesting thing what happens to you when you are hit with with something so devastating that you cannot quite comprehend it or grasp it. You almost lose touch with your physical body, and it's almost like you're watching it on TV happening to, to someone else. And I, I only remember at that point Rick asking and, and actually yelling into the phone, who is this? And he did it three times, and I was still fully aware, and, and I could hear him repeat back the name Jerry. And we would later learn that this, this Jerry is, in fact, the brother-in-law of the leader of the Church of Scientology, David Miscavige. And Jerry was the one that called you that night. He he was the one that called me, and not a police officer. Not a police officer. Rick, what do you remember about that? Not night? not Tom Brennan. Not a police officer. Not, not Tom Kyle's Brennan. dad. Not Kyle's dad. I I just remember my wife uh, screaming. I remember the phone going off. I'm still groggy. I remember my wife screaming, and then I remember Victoria collapsing on the on the floor. So naturally, I grabbed the phone. Who you know. What could be the information? Who could be the person delivering such information? Uh, and I, I had to know, uh, you know, what the, what the heck was going on? Um, and I do remember shouting at him, yelling. I, I think anybody, anybody would. Yeah, yeah. Um, Especially if it's not a police officer. It's like, well, who are you? <laughs> exactly. And you didn't know who this guy was. We had no well, idea. Had no idea. He, he just said Jerry. Um, so, and you come and, to find out that Jerry was there, right? And yeah. we have to say, you know, we're going to talk about the red flags. There's the first red flag right there from the first evening, the first phone call. I mean, why wasn't it the Clearwater Police? Why wasn't it Tom's father? Why wasn't it Kyle's father, Tom? Why, why you know, uh, it's extremely troubling. Yeah. And and it it opens the door, which we will talk about today. Why was this man there that night? Right at the scene where your son was killed. When did you go down to Clearwater? I actually did not go to Clearwater until it was two thousand and nine. Um, it was after it took us almost two years to have the case closed, and I was becoming. I was very concerned because I knew the statute of limitations um, was up in two years. And and if if they did not close the case, the Clearwater Police Department did not close the case in that time period, that would mean that I would have no way of getting in there and and, and finding out um, some of the answers to the questions that, that I had. So in 2009, when the, 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 the case closed, and I had to go seek help from senators in the state of Florida and Virginia to have this done. In 2009, when, when, when the case closed and the attorney, I had to hire an attorney um, just also to try to get some of my questions answered. He, and he, he received a copy of the police report, and, and it just went quiet. And a few days passed, and he called me up, and he said, I, I, I think you need to come to Florida. There are things that need to be said that should not be discussed on the telephone. So, the, And the attorney recognized in the police report, saw right away, th- there's a lot of this that doesn't make any sense. A- absolutely, absolutely. And, and what he did was he, he contacted a retired Clearwater police um, homicide detective to come in and also look over that police report. And so when I flew to Florida for that meeting, that detective, the retired homicide detective, um, was there and the lawyer, and we sat at a big table, and, and 
and, and the detective was, was just wonderful. He was like a character out of a TV show that you would expect. He, he was um, bigger than life and kind of um, rough around the edges. And he sat across from me and he said, um, Victoria, I'm going to tell you some things today that no parent should ever have to hear. And he, always, he referred to me as kid. He goes, you're going to have to be strong, kid. You're going to have to be really strong because your son needs you to be because it, it, it's not good when I'm reading, you know, out of this police report. And we have no way. He was the first um, person to look it over and say, there's no way that it can be determined by what is in this report that that Kyle actually committed suicide because that was the that was the initial story right that you were told that your son is dead down in Clearwater Florida in the home of his father whom he was visiting his father of course very involved in the church of scientology connected to the family of of the church leader David Miscavige and you were told initially Kyle shot himself in the head. Kyle is dead of a suicide. That's right. And they said initially that a suicide note had been found. And later on, the police admitted there was no suicide note. We are talking with Victoria and Rick Britton. Kyle Brennan, Victoria's son and Rick's stepson, died in 2007 in the home of his biological father, Tom Brennan, down in Clearwater, Florida. Still unexplained mysteries about his death. We're talking about that today on a special Inside Charlottesville. I'm Coy Barefoot. Stay with us. It's 37 minutes after the hour of 4 p.m. on this beautiful Tuesday. I'm Coy Barefoot, and you're listening to Inside Charlottesville on WCHV 107.5 FM. We are live online right now at InsideSeville.com. We're spending the entirety of the program today discussing the tragic and still unexplained death of 20-year-old Charlottesville resident Kyle Brennan at the home of his Scientologist father, Tom Brennan, down in Clearwater, Florida in February of 2007. Kyle's mother, Victoria Britton, and stepfather, Rick Britton, are live in studio with me. And we want to uh, remind folks that uh, this may not be an appropriate conversation for younger listeners. Victoria, how soon did you get a real palpable sense that what the police were telling you about Kyle's death just didn't seem to make sense? Like, when did you really get an appreciation for, wait, wait, wait a minute, you, you said this, but now I learned this, and you said that earlier, and w- when did you get a sense that, that something wasn't quite right here? Well, initially, I had my oldest son. Um, he was the person who made the first contact with the Clearwater Police Department because I was um, really catatonic with grief, so I told him that he was going to have to be the person to to do this for the family and and he came back to me and he was he was deeply disturbed by how they treated him uh, they he, we had a, a list of questions that we had that we wanted answers for and the detective who was put in charge did not answer them he and they were very basic questions they were not you know, over the top, um, crazy or unrealistic. And, and one of them was we knew that Kyle had um, discovered a weapon in, in the father's home on a, on a previous visit. But his, his other brother was with him at the time who just, um, just got out of um, the, the service. He had served overseas in the military. And there was no ammunition with the weapon. And, and, and his brother actually searched the house to make sure that there was no ammunition with this weapon. And the father, he said he had inherited it, and it, it, it came down through him, through his father. And he has no interest in, in weapons or ever firing it. So the big question was, was where did this in, 
where did this the ammunition come from? When was it purchased? We knew Kyle had not purchased it because you have to be 21 in the state of Florida to purchase ammunition for a, a hand weapon. And, and they would not answer that question for us. And it was very simple. And the second really big red flag was the detective initially told us that Kyle's hands were not tested for gunpowder residue. And, and I was very disturbed by that because that's really a, um, a 101 police procedure that you would have. Not only are you, when, when there is a, a death and a weapon is involved, you're going to, to, to bag and you're going to test those hands. And not only of the victim, but of the people who are there and who are in the vicinity of um, the victim also. And so the father's hands were never tested either. So, so we, we were very concerned about that. And then we also learned that his medication that he was taking, the Lexapro, was found locked in the trunk of his father's vehicle. And I had had a conversation just a few days prior with the father and we discussed Kyle's medication, and I asked him, I, I had some concerns that, um, you know, I know, you know, if you are a Scientologist, you are very much opposed to, to psychotropic medications and psychiatry. And it's not, I mean... And that's no secret. They uh, are very outspoken against their... And it is very extreme and vicious on their part. I mean, they feel that they are here, they want to wipe out psychiatry off of the face of this earth. And that psychiatrists have created all the ills in this this world have been cre- has been created by psychiatrists this is how extreme their views are on it and and I, and I knew this but I, I I I didn't think that it would go as far as where they would interfere with removing the medication um, so that my son would not have access to it so we had, and I'm, I know I'm kind of going off track a little bit, and I had had a conversation um, with him just several days prior when I questioned him about this, you know. With had, your ex-husband. With my ex-husband, yeah. have you seen Kyle's medication? And he said, no, I, I haven't seen it. And I said, I told him, I do not want you interfering with this medication. Um, you are not to do that. And he said, oh, well, I would never do that. And, and he admits it in the deposition. Um, when he was deposed in, in 2010, he was asked, um, did you have a conversation with your ex-wife where she told you to make sure your son had his medication and was taking it? And he said, yes, I had that conversation. And, and the attorney at the time who um, was representing the estate of my son, Ken Dandar, said, well, but you did whatever you wanted to do anyway. And he goes, that's right, I did. So he. So do we know for a fact that Tom Brennan, Kyle's father, actually took Kyle's medication and locked it in his truck? Well, the, the evidence... And that's where the medicine was found, right? It, it was right. found in there. And when you um, go back to the, the very, the first reports that were coming out of Clearwater... It, the the detective that, who was on the scene that night, he did testify that um, he thought that it appeared that Kyle's father took control of that medication. Yeah. He testified to that and that his father admitted that he took the medication. Later on, um, it, which the story changed and it was um, he created another storyline where, Kyle, he says Kyle gave him the medication. And because there is nobody there to witness that, um, there was a decision to be made. Is he telling the truth or is he, is he making this up to avoid liability? And, and Rick, just to, so people know, Kyle, who was 20 years old at the time of his death, where was he found and, and what was the situation that, that the police report, what does it document about how Kyle's body was discovered and uh, who called the police and this kind of stuff? Well, while it's really disturbing and, um, and upsetting, Kyle was found um, in 
not his bedroom in his father's apartment, but in his father's bedroom. Um, and um, his shattered head, um, they found uh, stuffed into a laundry basket. Um, but there's so many, there, there's, there are just so many questions. Um, she's already alluded to a number of them. They, they never produced the bullet. Uh, we were told initially that, um, that a gunshot residue test had not been done, done on his hands and that the weapon had not been processed for fingerprints. We found out later on that both of those were lies that the police told us. Um, there had been a GSR, a gunshot residue test, done on Kyle's hands, but the detective in charge of the investigation stopped that from being processed. So that test was actually done, but not processed. And I think since that time now, that GSR test has been lost in Clearwater, Florida, uh, conveniently. What do we know about the results of that test? Was any gun residue well, found on the, Kyle's the, hand? The test, was, the test was never processed. So they, they did the test on the hands, but it wasn't processed. So, and it was lost. So now we'll never know. They didn't find uh, fingerprints. There was no ridge detail on the weapon that was found alongside Kyle. It was a uh, Taurus uh, 357 Magnum. Uh, his fingerprints on there were no fingerprints on it. There was no blood on it. So in other words, someone had taken that weapon, if indeed and wiped that it was, clean, and wiped it clean. The bullet wasn't produced. And they uh, couldn't say where the ammunition came from. They couldn't say what the ammunition came, where the ammunition came from. And Kyle's father, uh, when he was, uh, the number of times that the police talked to him, including his deposition when he was uh, interrogated by um, the lawyer representing the estate of Kyle Brennan, he gave uh, three different stories. Three different stories, not two, three different stories as to the weapon, the ammunition, where it was stored, and whether Kyle knew there was a weapon and ammunition in the house. Based on all the available evidence of the of the depositions and the statements that are in the record from Kyle's father, can you line all that up in a timeline, one next to the other? And when you do that and you read everything that Kyle's dad says and has said about what happened that night, does his story seem to change? His story does change. His story changes and the stories told by... Um, the subsequent def the defendants, the Scientology, celebrity Scientologist defendants um, in our wrongful death loss, uh, lawsuit, their stories change as time goes by. Now you so, said they, you so they didn't even they didn't even take the time to s all sit down together and try to get the same story right. They didn't even get the stories right. And they're, we're not talking about minor differences. We're talking about glaring, obvious differences. Now, you said Scientology. I'm going to take a quick break. And when we get back, let's, let's sort of pull that part of the story in, into this conversation. Kyle Brennan, 20 years old, who died tragically and still mysteriously in the home of his father his, in 2007 in Clearwater, Florida. Kyle's father, Tom, a very active member of the Church of Scientology, connected to the family of David Miscavige, the, the church leader. And when we get back, let's talk about the fact that Tom Brennan called members of the church to his home before anyone ever called 911. Let's talk about that. We're talking with Victoria and Rick Britton about the death of Kyle Brennan in 2007. It's eight minutes in front of the hour of 5 p.m. here in Central Virginia. I'm Coy Barefoot. You're listening to Inside Charlottesville on 107.5 FM WCHV. It's 87 degrees here in this little city I love. I hope you are well, and I'm glad you're here. We're doing something a little bit different on the program today. We are spending the entire program focusing a conversation on the tragic and still unexplained mysteries of surrounding the death of 20-year-old Charlottesville resident Kyle Brennan. Kyle passed away in the home of his father in Clearwater, Florida, in February of 2007. Victoria Britton and Kyle's stepfather, Rick Britton, are with us. Victoria, 
what do we know about um, any of the forensics tests? We know they never found the bullet that police say Kyle killed himself. We don't know where the ammunition came from. They never found a bullet. There's no fingerprints on the gun. The gun had no blood on it. Um, what do we know about any of the other forensic tests that were done, autopsy reports, any of that? Well, if we can back up just a little bit, when we were discussing the room that Kyle was found in, initially um, the father had told us that Kyle was found in his room. and In Kyle's room. In Kyle's room. And later that would change to where it was the father's room. And regarding the forensic tests on on the weapon, and not only did they test the weapon, but they tested um, 14 items that were found in and around Kyle. There was some extra ammunition. They they found some um, bullets in his pocket. All of these items were tested, and all of them came back negative. There were no fingerprints found on any of these 14 items that were tested. So Kyle had Kyle's body had bullets in the pocket, and yet there were no fingerprints on those there, bullets? There were no fingerprints at all on any yeah. on these 14 pieces items that had been tested for for fingerprints and ridge detail they came back negative how is that even possible i know i'm just how sitting there thinking possible? how can you put something in your pocket you, and your you, fingerprints aren't on it yeah that's not possible was there anything we can learn about maybe if he was left-handed or right-handed and well well he was right-handed and and, and that was a a question that was asked of me when when i went to florida by the retired homicide detective because there, there was a question about, um, and, and I'm not a forensic expert, about the, the entry wound because it, it seemed like the larger, um, and maybe Rick can step in and explain, um, explain this. I think, I think what she's trying to say, and you correct me if I'm wrong about this, but Kyle was right-handed and the entry wound was on the left-hand side of the head. Which doesn't make any sense if it does, was a suicide. Does does not make any sense. Right. There's so many things about this that don't make any sense at all. And and we also the um, medical examiner said that it was at a um, it was a downward um, the the bullet trajectory went downward, and that from what I was told from the homicide detective that just that's not what happens in suicides it's it's usually a straight through or you're you're putting it in in an upward um, angle so the entry is on the left side of his skull and forgive me i'm being graphic i know but i just want to understand with a downward trajectory a downward trajectory on the left side of his skull and he's right-handed that's right it, it, it really didn't make any sense. So here's what we're going to do. I need to take another break for some news. But when we come back, I want to talk about um, who was called to Tom's residence that night. Two of the upper echelon members of the Church of Scientology were there that night. One of them was the one who actually called you a few hours later um, and and told you what had happened um, I want to talk about who these people were, why they were there, uh, what we know about them. And uh, there's also some mysteries there as well. You know, why, did, why was Kyle's computer taken by them? Why was Kyle's medication, uh, his Lexapro, why was that found locked in the father's car? Um, there's a, just a, a number of mysteries here that we are talking about. And again, to remind people... There's there's no speculation of a of a narrative here. I, I I don't think any of us have that. There's no speculation like, well, this is probably what happened. We don't know what happened, and that's, that's right. the whole point. That's right. The police say they think they know what happened, but the evidence doesn't support that conclusion. It does not. It does not. And then the defendants used the police report to avoid the lawsuit. And remind us really quickly, there was a lawsuit. Correct? There was a lawsuit, and it was filed in um, the. Um, U.S. District Court, Tampa Division, June 17, 2010, against Tom Brennan. Uh, Kyle's the, father. The yeah. two other um, Scientologists that we're going to talk about, the Church of Scientology itself and Flag Service Organization. They filed a motion for summary judgment, basically asking the judge to, to summarily dismiss the case. That was granted. We filed an appeal, and then we lost the appeal. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and um, the cult of secrecy 
that is the Church of Scientology and how that may or may not have been involved with Kyle's tragic death in 2007. You're listening to Inside Charlottesville on 107.5 FM WCHV. I'm Coy Barefoot. Stay with us. Today on the program, we are discussing the tragic death of 20-year-old Kyle Brennan, a resident of Charlottesville. He was found dead of a gunshot wound to the head in the home of his Scientologist father, Tom Brennan, in Clearwater, Florida, in February of 2007. There are a number of unexplained mysteries and unanswered questions about Kyle's tragic death. Kyle's mother, Victoria Britton, and stepfather, Rick Britton, are live in studio today. Rick, you mentioned before we went to a break that there was a lawsuit, that y'all That's filed right. a wrongful death lawsuit uh, in Kyle's death um, against members of the Church of Scientology, the church who, as we're going to discuss in more detail here in right. a few minutes, they appear to have been uh, very involved in the proceedings that night. To what extent there's any, you know, uh, b- b- criminal behavior, we don't know. We have no right. idea. We right. just don't know. And that really that's is, right. that's the key takeaway here is there's a whole lot of unanswered questions here. Tell me about that case, that that wrongful death case. Well, we, um, to try to get an attorney and, and you know, we, we uh, couldn't afford to, to pay. So we, we went and we were lucky. We found an attorney, two attorneys, that had been involved in a successful lawsuit against the Church of Scientology in another famous case, and that was the Lisa McPherson case from what year? The Lisa McPherson case was from 1995, and right. I wanted to add something to what Rick is saying, and that is it's about how just extremely difficult it is to find an attorney who is w- just willing to to take on um anything with the, a connection with the Church of Scientology. And, and with Kyle, you had um, people who were brought into um, this lawsuit. One of them was Denise Miscavige Gentile. This is the twin sister of the leader of the Church of Scientology. And she is um, what was called um, an auditor to Kyle's father. And this is mean it's like a spiritual counselor that they go to and and they ask um, she asks him questions and he responds. In and, AA you call that your sponsor. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It somebody is. who's there it to, is. somebody who's there who has your back and is uh, and is there to look out for you. Right. Giving you advice. Right. Yeah. I, I, exactly. And so w- with Kyle being there, one of the things that I wanted it, it became a problem for both of them because Kyle was considered in Scientology um, lingo a suppressive person. And this means to um, a Scientologist, it's someone to be reviled and and avoided. And that is because um, of his connection to psychiatry and psychotropic medications. And they, to a Scientologist, SPs are not... um, just merely enemies of the church, their very being is capable of contaminating a Scientologist, causing him to make errors, have accidents, even to become sick. So with Kyle's presence there in Clearwater, it became a huge problem for not only his father, but for Denise Miscavige, the twin sister of the leader, because they would not be able to continue on with their training within Scientology until they handled the problem. That can't be stressed enough. The the, the future of Tom Brennan and his Scientology auditor, Denise Miscavige Gentile, is, is based on whether Kyle stays there or not. The, him being there with his father in the apartment in Clearwater, jeopardizes to them their future in the Church of Scientology. That can't be stressed enough. So I don't understand why they wouldn't just say, hey, this is Tom's son. He's just visiting. He's not going to live here. 
he's passing through because that was the case. He was on his way back up to Charlottesville. He's coming back up. Exactly. Uh, he was just visiting while he was out on the road. Well, that's what you and I would say. Right. But he is an enemy. He is an enemy of this organization. Of the Church of Scientology. Do, is there any kind of record that, that maybe Tom was told, hey, you got to do something about your son? Uh, absolutely. Um, and An order was issued from what they call um, an ethics officer, which means he's he's being reported to... Um, an ethics officer at flag service organization that something is wrong and you need to take care of it. And this is very serious. What's flag services organization? Flag is service, that part of the church? Um, it, it actually is. It is. Um, it is at their spiritual headquarters, and this is where they go for training and and what they call auditing. And this is when they are on what's called an e meter. It's in the Fort Harrison Hotel in Clearwater, which is right, their right international down the street, headquarters, right down the street from where, a few blocks from right, where, right. where Kyle's body was found. That's right. That's right. And it is an important. People come from all over the world to to study here and in, in, in the uh, flag service organization. So it's it's an important place. Yeah. And um, so, an order was issued on February fifteenth that from the ethics officer from flag service organization that his father had to handle Kyle. And now handling to you and me may mean one thing, you know, as a, you know, a manner of how we treat something. But that's a church term. It's it, is. it is. Yeah. A church it means term. something specific. It means something very, very different. And it's a very well-known Scientology terms, and it means to take care of the situation, removing a trouble source. And it's, it, it, which means also includes enemies of the church. And there's a part of this code with handling where, and this is from L. Ron Hubbard. We have not discussed, you know, Scientology and when it was the founded. founder, the founder right, of right. the Church uh, of Scientology. But he said, you know, when you handle someone and an enemy, they may be deprived of property or injured by any means by any Scientologist. They may be tricked, sued, or lied to, or destroyed. That's a direct quote from L. Ron Hubbard. And this, and they had get issued an order to Tom, Kyle's father, you need to handle your son. That's he right. is a suppressive person. We have identified him as an enemy of the church yep. because, number one, he's not a member. Number two, he's on Lexapro. He goes to a psychiatrist. That's he right. has medication. That's right. And within 36 hours, Kyle was dead. We're talking with Victoria Britton and Rick Britton. Victoria is the mother of Kyle Brennan, who was found dead in the home of his Scientologist father, Tom Brennan, in February of 2007. We'll take a quick break. There's more when we get back. We're talking with Victoria Britton and Rick Britton. Kyle Brennan, Victoria's son and Rick's stepson, was found dead in the home of his biological father in Clearwater, Florida in February of 2007. Police believed that he was a suicide victim, a gunshot wound to the head, a gun at his side. But Rick, a number of unanswered questions to remind people who are just joining us. We don't know if there was conclusively any gunshot residue on Kyle's hand. No That's bullet right. was found. We don't know where the... There were no uh, fingerprints on the gun. There were no fingerprints on the gun. The story of uh, Kyle's father who was there that night, his story changes every time he does right. a deposition. His timeline of that evening, where he was, what time he arrived home, those things all changed in the course of the next few yeah. uh, months. Um, so you can't say conclusively that Kyle was a suicide, that that weapon that was found alongside him, that that was the weapon uh, that killed him? We uh, don't know. You, you can't say. And again, you, that is the takeaway from this conversation. That's right. We don't know. And if you take the time to look at all of this evidence, it's just one mystery after another. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to come to the conclusion that something different must have happened. There are too many of these things. It just piles up and piles up. There's just too many of them. You have to come to the conclusion that the real story, the truth— is something different, something other than what's stated in the police report. And that's what ended up happening in our case. The defendants in the wrongful death lawsuit that we brought, they attached the police report 
to their motion for summary judgment. So naturally, the judge in the federal district court, he reads this police report, and it seems to be a, an open and shut case. I mean, Kyle of somebody who is dead at their own hand. Kyle committed suicide. I yeah. mean, but but their lies, their 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 actual bald faced lies told by the police and the medical examiner's office in the police report. Lies told by the police. Victoria, what do we know about the police who were there that night? Um, and again, we, we, we we're going to talk more about the connection to Scientology because Tom, Kyle's father, didn't call the police at first like any of us would do. He called his spiritual advisor in the Church of Scientology who lived uh, a short distance away, and she and her husband came over that night. We're going to talk about that, but before we do, what do we know about the police who were there that night, the Clearwater police? Well, we know that there were um, five um, police officers on the scene, and, and, the, and the, the officer that was put in charge was a, um, he was a, he was a patrolman um, who was just out of college um, for a couple of years, if that, and he had the least experience of, of, of all of them. And in his deposition, he, when he's describing the interview that was conducted with um, Kyle's father, he said the interview lasted, in his words, a short period of time, no more than 15 to 20 minutes. And throughout most of the, the when he is being questioned, when it comes to the questions regarding uh, the, the police um, work that was done, um, he responds with, I-, I do not recall. When he's asked questions about a mysterious couple that is on the scene, um, he says, I do not recall. His deposition was very brief, and I think there was um, over close to two-thirds of the questions that um, he was asked, he responds with, I do not recall. So and to it, top it off, the notes of his interview with Tom Brennan... Um, he admitted he destroyed, which is ba- basically against police procedure, standard police procedure. So records of that night, of what happened that night, have, have disappeared. That's right. Tests weren't done. Right. Um, Tests weren't processed. Tests were done on the hands but weren't processed. Weren't taken to the lab. And then, yeah. it, Right. And then they were lost. Victoria, who did Tom Brennan, Kyle's father, who did he call over to the house that night? Well, well, the story, it gets somewhat convoluted. The first story that his father told um, the family after Kyle died was that he arrived home on that evening of February 16th at 10.30 p.m. after having dinner with friends. In less than 24 hours, that story would change along um, with the timeline where he is now at the state fair grounds selling Scientology books, and he arrives home at 11.15 um, to 11.20. And the call for help did not go out that evening until 10 minutes after midnight. And he, the person that he had called, it was a year and a half had passed, and they they called um, Denise Miscavige Gentilly. This is the twin sister of the leader, um, David Miscavige, is called into the police department for questioning. And in, in one of the questions is, you know, you know, what were you doing that evening? And she's there, well, you know, it was 11 o'clock that evening and um, Tom Brennan stopped by to my house and he had to borrow a book that was very important. Um, And he left um, within a couple of minutes, and within 10 minutes, um, he called me again and said, you know, Denise, what should I do? I have found my son. What should I do? And just that alone, that anybody, when you think of a parent coming home and, and, and finding their child, you know, on the floor, I don't know at that time, dead or dying, that you would have to call someone and ask them what to do is, is, is deeply disturbing. And, and to me, it tells you a little bit about the mindset of someone who's been involved in this organization for a long time where they cannot think for themselves. Especially when we have evidence and we know of toddlers who've called 911 That's if they right. find their parents That's on the right. ground. That's right. I mean, exactly. toddlers know what to do. Right, but it speaks to the type of dependency that's created between uh, a spiritual advisor and somebody they're advising, the kind of dependency that he has to make 
a ridiculous phone call. So like this that. woman, his uh, spiritual advisor, she came over to the house that night with her husband. Is that what we think? Well, the, the first story is she she tell she lies to the to the police detective um, during um, the, this line of questioning and says, "Well, I, I never went down to the apartment at all. I stayed home. I never went in the vehicle. Only my husband Jerry went to the apartment." And, and later the story would change where she did go to the apartment, but it still became a little bit odd because they created the story where she didn't go near the apartment because she was in her pajamas. And um, we would be here for a long time if we ever started going into some of the, um, the different storylines that th- these three defendants gave. But what it, what, it, what it gave to me was they established a, a timeline on how long it took to get from um, the miscavaged until a home to Tom Brennan's apartment, which is no more than 10 minutes. And... So you have them, and if the call for help did not go out until 10 minutes after midnight, even with the second version of the story, if we were to believe that to be true, and I'm going to add that I do not. I think the first version that he was home at 10, 10.30 is the correct one. Um, and if that's the correct one, then he, no one called the police for nearly two hours later. Well, not only did they not call the police, but we know Kyle is alive at that time. That um, because he after he had died, his cell phone bill came to our home and he was making phone calls, 1024, 1023. He was calling um, personal injury lawyers in Clearwater and he was pleading for help. He said, you know, somebody, please help me. So we, we know Kyle is alive at that time. And so this places um, his father in the apartment with him when Kyle is alive. The first version of the story. Yeah. We were told initially that Tom Brennan arrived home at 1030. We believe that in almost all the cases, the initial stories were the ones closest to the truth and that things changed later when people sat down and realized that they they had to distance themselves from the apartment, and they had to distance themselves from this unfortunate death. So the initial story is that Tom Brennan, and he told us, he told me that he arrived home at 1030. Kyle was alive at 1030. That puts him in the apartment with Kyle alive. Now, if the second version, this is what Victoria is saying, if the second version we believe that places him at the apartment at 1115, but it also places Denise and her husband Gerald uh, Gentilly at the apartment with the body, and they wait almost an hour before they call the police. What were those people doing in that apartment? And didn't they take his computer? What's, this, what's that story? They did. Well, well, the story with, with the computer, um, Kyle's older brother asked his father to please send all of Kyle's belongings back home, and, and with it came the computer. And his um, sister-in-law, really sharp young woman, she wanted to look at it because Kyle liked to write, and he was very proud of his work, and she wanted to see what he had been working on um, before he had died. And she immediately took note that the computer had been accessed just um, within a couple of hours after he died. And so this means somebody would have gone in there um, in the middle of, of the night, of um, early morning hours of February 17th, and had gone through his computer. And we could not understand why someone would even be thinking to do something like that at such a moment. Why would that ha- be of any importance. That's right. And and this started, um, his brother contacted the, the Clearwater Police, de- um, Detective Stephen Bowling, who was in charge at the time, and made him aware of this um, because we were very upset. We wanted we, we wanted to know who did this and what was their motive for, for doing it. And, and this started off, um, and, and things changed immediately. Right after this was discovered, the father hired an attorney, uh, a very expensive um, attorney from a law firm that represents Scientology cases in that area. 
Um, we're, we never really are quite sure how he could afford this attorney. But it, it, the, the information after that, getting information um, from the police department um, and, and from the father, it really it made it extremely difficult after this attorney was, was hired. Clearly, there are so many unanswered questions about the tragic death of this young man. Yep. Is it possible that Kyle's dad could have killed him? Is it possible that Tom Brennan could have shot his son and then there was and then he freaked out and called members of the church to help cover it up? Is that because I'm guaranteeing you there's people listening right now who've been with us since the beginning who are thinking, well, I wonder if that and, and I'm not saying that happened. I'm saying is that possible given you know so much more about this than I do, but is that even a possible narrative here? Well, I can um, give you a, a direct quote about how um, a, a Scientology philosophy on how to handle and to disconnect from someone like Kyle, who is a perceived enemy of the church. And it is um, one of their, their quotes is, never fear to hurt another in a just cause. And, and, and Kyle was potentially a huge um, PR flap for um, flag service organization because you have, you have the twin sister of the leader who's involved. And, and, and they don't want the miscavige name involved in, in certainly anything like this. And, and another part of their um, belief system is, is that, you know, if Kyle's dead, it's no big deal. Because he can just go and pick up another body. He just dropped his body because they believe that we are these um, immortal souls that just keep coming back over and over and over again um, for billions of years. So when you die in Scientology, or um, it's no big deal. It, it doesn't matter to what them. What happened to Denise Miscavige, uh, the... Uh the, the spiritual advisor to Tom Brennan. Where, where is she today? Well, I know in 2013, she's still a member of the Church of Scientology. I know in 2013, she was um, a, a journalist for the Tampa Bay Tribune. Joe Childs um, broke a story about her, and she had been, uh, well, she was arrested for um, trading. Uh, marijuana blunts for rent um, and some apartments that she owned in the St. Pete's Tampa Bay area. And so from so where she is um, right now, I have I have no idea. But how about Tom Brennan, your ex-husband? He is. Um, I do not know. The last I had heard that he was no longer um, a member of the Church of Scientology, that they um, I'm not sure if they kicked him out. Um, it would be a smart move if they does did. Does he still live down there? <laughs> no, he does not. He does not. He's, he's living in the New York area. We're talking with Victoria Britton and Rick Britton. There's more when we get back. This is Inside Charlottesville. I'm Coy Barefoot. This is a special edition of Inside Charlottesville. We've been discussing the tragic death of Kyle Brennan, 20 years old, a resident of Charlottesville. He was found dead of an apparent gunshot wound to the head in the home of his Scientologist father, Tom Brennan, in February of 2007. Kyle's mother and stepfather are live in studio. Help me understand, Victoria, what we know about what Denise and her husband, Jerry, Denise, the twin sister of David Miscavige, the head of the Church of Scientology, was involved in Tom Brennan's life, was his spiritual, was the spiritual advisor to your ex-husband. Uh, it, it sounds like a soap opera, but it does. It's, it's amazing that, that Tom Brennan had this connection to the upper echelons of the Church of Scientology, and when he apparently discovers his son's body, uh, or dead or dying, in his home that night, he calls his spiritual advisor. He doesn't call nine one one, and and uh, according to even the most generous 
timeline of what we understand. They clearly waited a long time before anyone ever called police. What do we know about what they said happened that night? Well, you know, I'm going to back up a little bit, and we will talk about Denise um, Miscavige and and just how they became ensnared in their own lies regarding that evening. When, when she was deposed in 2010, and the attorney for the state um, pressed for more details regarding that 11 o'clock timeline that she you know, conveniently gave to Kyle's father. He asked her, what book did he borrow that was so important that he would have to come by to your home? Because that's what she o'clock. said, right? She that's said, yeah, at 11, 11 o'clock, o'clock right. That was the alibi. Kyle's father was over here. He borrowed right. a book from me. That's right. right, and it just seemed very contrived and convenient. And she she gave a, a very gave a very detailed answer and said, well, he came by, he, he really needed that to uh, learn more about e-meters, which, of course, is what they use in auditing. It's like sure. a crude um, lie detector test. Right. And, and the book belonged to me. And, and Denise she, said. Denise, Denise said. Yeah, yeah, it belonged to me. And, and she got into some details, and I, I'll spare you the, um, the Scientology lingo that, that went with it because we wouldn't understand it. And so when the father was deposed, um, he was asked, you know, what book did you have was so important that you had to stop by at at Denise Miscavige's home at 11 o'clock? And he gave a completely different book. Not only was the book different, but he even went on to say, and the book belonged to Denise's husband, and he also had, um, during that that line of questioning, had said, you know, I, I placed a phone call to Kyle before I, I went to Denise's home that night, but he didn't pick up the phone. But there were no incoming phone calls um, to Kyle that evening. So we knew that, you know, th- that was a lie also. But they didn't even get the book right. And, and yeah. they were so consumed with establishing a timeline that would take them away from that apartment, it, it, it you know, it just raised a, a big red flag. You know, why would you feel the need to do that? But what, what they did establish earlier was that, it you know, it did only take 10 minutes to get from her home to the Brennan apartment. And her story also changed when she was deposed, where now, you know, the first time when the police were questioning her, she didn't go near the apartment now, she did go to the. She she did. The story get in that changes. Call. It changed, yeah, a- absolutely, and and it changed. And so now now she's she's there in that vicinity. She says she didn't go up to the apartment, although the officer claims that there was a couple there. But it does. And like I had said earlier, the phone call for help did not go out until twelve ten. So this is all of these three people. We have um, um, Kyle's father. We have the twin sister of the leader of the Church of Scientology, Denise Miscavige Gentile. We have her husband, Gerald. They are all in the apartment with my son. And I do not know what is transpiring at this time. I do not know if he's alive at this time. I do not know if he's dead. I, I, have, I have no way of knowing what is happening but i do know that they are there and what they are doing in there for that length of time what is transpiring uh, uh, you know it, it, over eight years have passed and i still do not have an answer to and that ultimately question. that's what you're after right it's just right. some sense of truth about what really happened that night that's because right. what happened to clearly Kyle. everybody's story keeps changing the police report that's is right. is full of lies and um you know, there's no fingerprints on the gun. They never find the bullet. He's right-handed, and the entry wound is on the upper left side of his head. It, we could go on and on and on and on. It's just full of mysteries. That's right. And yet still, this mother doesn't know what happened to her son. All these years later. And we, c- we couldn't even get these answers from the police, uh, who are supposed to be public servants. Who are being? We're we're telling them over the telephone. We're asking them these questions. Can't you find out about this? Can't you find out about that? But basically, what we get from the Clearwater Police is the brush off. 
That was the that was the sense from them. You people are way far away up in the state of Virginia, a thousand miles away. Just leave us alone. Yeah. Just, just go, get you go off away. The, get you just off the phone. Away. Out of sight, and, out of and, mind. It becomes much worse than that because in that uh, police report, they actually you you have the 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 outright obvious lies, but then you have um, lies of omission. And these are the facts that, that they were given that are not in the police report that are very important and, and that would certainly change how someone might think about the case if they were in, had been included. And some of the lies were so egregious, they even um, have quoted me saying things that I never said. And these quotes would make it this you know Kyle's death in the case the the wrongful death suit was a very high profile case in in the Clearwater area it it played out on the front pages of the Tampa Bay Tribune and these lies that were the, the statements that were attributed to me that I, that they said that I made about my son were put on the front pages of newspapers and and I can't tell you how surreal and horrific that is to look at a newspaper and read a quote that you, they're saying that you said and you never did. And this stuff was just uh, put into the police report as if it that's was right. gospel. That's right. And the judge in the wrongful death lawsuit, that's all the judge had was this that's right. trumped up police report. Along with other things like this. And I quote, this is from uh, police detective Stephen Bowling, quote, the doctor, Kyle's doctor, confirmed that Kyle had been exhibiting early signs of schizophrenia to include paranoia and delusions and advised that he was not aware of any major side effects if one was to suddenly stop taking Lexapro. Kyle's psychiatrist, under oath, stated that he had never had any contact with anybody in the, in the police department or the medical examiner's office. They both lied. Further, they concocted this diagnosis. The police. The police did. So probably what he did is he went up on a Wikipedia site and found some information about Lexapro and made up this diagnosis. Kyle's psychiatrist, under oath, stated that he was, quote, perplexed and dumbfounded by their statements. He had absolutely no contact with anybody in the police department or the medical examiner's but the police office. Are, but the police are saying that they called him and talked to they him. They talked to him, that they talked to him, and that he advised them of these things. They made up this diagnosis. He said he was perplexed, dumbfounded, and that, of course, he's bound by confidentiality not to reveal these kinds of things. But he went ahead and did reveal what his diagnosis of Kyle was, and it wasn't schizophrenia to include paranoia and delusions. It was mild anxiety and depression. A totally different story. These were these were bald face, egregious lies in the police told report. by the police. Right, they were just making stuff up, making stuff up to to make it to really make it go away. He committed suicide because he's schizophrenic and paranoid and having these delusions, and he committed suicide. And this goes along. And, it know. went into the suicide narrative. It, Ab- it's absolutely. there to back up the idea that absolutely. this was a suicide. Absolutely, absolutely. Why would the police do that? What crosses your mind, Rick, when it comes to the... the a, a part of this story is, you know, allegations of, of police misconduct, police, police corruption, lying, right. corruption, um, and, and it raises a lot of questions. What, and, but there's also the whole Scientology aspect of this. Uh-huh. Tom Brennan, you, you know, uh, Kyle Brennan, 20 years old, on, uh, on, a, on medication, goes to visit his father. His father just happens to be in the Church of Scientology. His spiritual advisor just happens to be the twin sister of the leader of the Church of Scientology. Right. So Kyle walks into uh, an environment that arguably he's not really prepared for. Right. He walks into the heart of Scientology in many respects. Right. He and, does. Uh, and he turns up dead. Right. And everybody's saying, oh, yeah, I guess he killed himself. But there's there's really more evidence to show that it's not a suicide than there is. And it's well, just constant mysteries about it. Absolutely. That. And they're just there are just so many unanswered questions and so many. We're not talking about 
it might be a lie. We're talking about provable lies. There's so many easily provable lies that were told by all of the defendants that you just have to you have to come to the conclusion, like Victoria and I I have years ago, that something very different than what's stated in the police report happened that evening. What it is, we don't know. You cannot have a situation like this with all of these lies, with all of these unanswered questions, provable lies, and and think that, oh, yeah, that's the truth. Of course it's not the truth. Something very different happened. There's a documentary called Going Clear. It's based on a book uh, by the same name, I believe. That's right, Uh, by Lawrence Ray. And Kyle's story is in the book. It's not in the documentary, but it was mentioned in the book. That's right. People who are familiar with the Church of Scientology around the world are familiar with Kyle's story. A lot of our listeners right now may not be, um, and and they're learning about it for the first time. Uh Uh-huh. And I'd like to add something, because you mentioned um, the documentary Going Clear, and and one of the the main people who was interviewed for that show was a man named um, Mark or Marty Rathman, who was the, um, considered the, the, right-hand man to David Miscavige. Yeah, he was the number two guy in the church, right? Number two guy who was um, very important and and very high up there. And in 2012, he came out with a a story that broke on on WTSP in Tampa. And, And the story was in 1995, there was a young woman who had died um, under the care of Scientologist Lisa McPherson. And he broke the story that an an attorney um, who was a part of this case representing the the, the Church of Scientology, a former prosecutor named Attorney Lee Fugate, that he was told that Marty Rathburn um, was told by David Miscavige that they hired this um, former prosecutor to have illegal meetings, ex parte meetings with judges and um, people of influence in Pinellas County to make the Lisa McPherson case go away. And it cost the Church of Scientology $30 million to do this. Uh, Attorney Lee Fugate was the attorney representing Denise Miscavige Gentile in the wrongful death suit of my son. The so, same attorney. The same, same attorney. attorney. Yeah. Um, so it, it, y- there are a lot of questions that, like you said, remain unanswered. And the one thing that I ask myself repeatedly is, why lie? Why do people lie? Why would you feel the need to? Um, it, they do it because they're hiding something. Do you think the, the, the truth about what happened that night to your son is being covered up? Well, someone's covering it up, I mean, or they would come forward and just say, I I can answer that question for you, Victoria. I I can, you know, this is what we, this is what happened. But you've been asking questions for eight years now. For eight years. About the specifics of what happened that night, and you're still not getting any answers. No, no, I I am not. We we went to the, um, after the, the, the appeal was lost, um, Rick and I filed a case with the FBI, I had um, tried to get them to intervene early in the case when the Clearwater Police Department was um, investigating it because I, I knew that they, they were not conducting a proper investigation. I, I had concerns. And they did not become involved because it was really at that point the case was still open and it was a he said, she said. And after when the case was closed and, and we had lost the appeal and I had the time to go through the mountains of paperwork through those depositions. And I found, I mean, there were so many, I mean, we're going over some of the lies, but but we have a, a room in the back of our house. It's like 20 by 18. And I had that entire room filled with stacks of papers. And each of those stacks represented a lie that I had found in those depositions or in contradictions of the, of the defendants. And there was so much lying that I had to make um, sub piles next to it. I mean, it, it was it was it was it was overwhelming, and we brought them to the FBI in in was it 2013, and and filed a case with them, and it has been quiet ever since. And we also we had an expert criminologist 
look over the the work conducted by the police department. This was an I, undercover agent for the Department of Justice. Actually, an, an academic criminal, an academic, academic crim- yeah. criminologist who, who had worked some very high profile cases undercover. And he um, he his conclusion was that the investigation of my son's death was a farce. And, and a there farce, were, and it seemed obvious to him that there was some kind of connection between the Clearwater Police Department and the Church of Scientology. I can't imagine how, we got to wrap up here, we're out of time, but I, I just can't imagine how frustrating isn't the right word here. You, you get beyond fr- frustrated. You, you get frustrated when your Keurig doesn't work right. You know, right. I mean, that's frustration. This is not frustration. This is, this is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. And, yeah. and because very powerful, wealthy people aren't, aren't giving you the truth. That's exactly. right. It, it That's appears right. to me. Uh, it would appear that way. That's right. And, I, That's I, right. And, and there's just so many mysteries and unanswered questions. And if anyone deserves the truth, it would be the parent of a child who died by tragic and unexplained circumstances. If anyone on this planet deserves the truth, it is a parent who's lost a child. Where someone could say, we've really looked into it. This is what really happened. And right. And the truth will ex- will answer all those questions and make the mysteries go away. But right now, you don't have the truth because you're still living with unanswered questions and mysteries. Like with so many things in life, it's the it's the not knowing that gets you. Yeah, yeah. And without the truth, we can have no peace. We need and and I I need to believe that the truth still matters to people. Yeah. That it matters, and and I will keep pursuing the truth um, for as long as necessary until I have my questions answered. Kyle Brennan passed away tragically at the home of his Scientologist father, Tom Brennan, in February of 2007 in Clearwater, Florida. We've been talking with Kyle's mother, Victoria, and stepfather, Rick Britton, live in studio on Inside Charlottesville. My heart breaks for both of you. I know everybody listening their heart is breaking, and uh, thoughts and prayers go out to you and your family. And, uh, and the memory of Kyle and his uh, legacy, it's that legacy of this life of this young man that so tragically and mysteriously ended um, that merits some renewed struggle to find the the truth here and uh, um, thank you both for being here today thanks for having thank us you, Coy. i'm coy barefoot and you've been listening to inside charlottesville on wchv this conversation will be podcast online at insidecville.com